Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's wall-to-wall -wall live coverage of the Red Hot Red Hat Summit here in Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Streche. Rob, in the immortal words of Henry David Thoreau, simplify, simplify, simplify. That is what <laughs> we are, this is what customers want, this is what we keep hearing about. Absolutely, and I, I think there couldn't be a more perfect session to talk about the simplif simplif the <laughs> simplifying. It's been a long day. And we'll get there, oxygen. we'll get there. I need yeah. more oxygen, <laughs> a little oxygen bar. But no, I think you know, simplifying and having you know, an easy way to get to AI is really what we've been talking about all day long. Exactly, exactly. What a perfect segue to our next guests, who are both CUBE veterans. We have Michael Wells, engineering technologist at Dell Technologies. Thanks so much for coming back. And Ian Pilcher, senior principal product manager at Red Hat. Thank, Thank you. you both so much for coming on. Oh, Thank, Thank you for having us. Great to be here. So Dell Apex has been around for about six months. Before we get to what's new, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit, get, get, get them up to speed on, on what it is and, and right. positioning. So the Apex Cloud Platform for Red Hat OpenShift is um, it's an appliance uh, model that was uh, collaboratively built with uh, Dell and Red Hat uh, to simplify the process of running um, OpenShift on-premises, right? So uh, it gives you the ability to run bare metal so that you can take advantage of all of the features and capabilities within OpenShift, but it allows you to stand it up much faster uh, and it simplifies the lifecycle management of OpenShift itself. Because what we're doing is we're actually managing the entire um, update process from the um, hardware infrastructure all the way up through OpenShift itself in a single update workflow. So the way that OpenShift simplifies um, management of, uh, and um, life cycling of Kubernetes, we've taken that a step further and rolled the infrastructure into that as well. Yeah, I mean, what was interesting, because I, I got to be a part of that launch and what was fun having Chris Morgan on to talk about it, and I think when we looked at it, you know, he was like, Matt, Matt Hicks just told me, I want to be able to you know, turn up OpenShift in like five minutes. Right. You know, I want to put it in a rack <laughs> and go. And so, so I, I think again, part of that was you know, on you guys to really make this happen Absolutely. and have that. Where, where have we been since that? Because you know, stake in the ground, mission accomplished, up and easy and running. Okay, so what have you done for me lately? It's been six months, what, where are we at? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, as I said before, we've, we've made that even apexier. Uh, <laughs> so, um, with a number of enhancements coming in the near in the near future. So, adding capabilities, um, we're adding hosted control planes into the Apex platform, which is a really cool multi-cluster technology that enables all sorts of use cases around cluster as a service, multiple clusters with very rapid deployment and low overhead. Uh, we're also adding in object storage capability with Dell Object Scale. That will, of course, support applications that have a requirement for object storage. Um, and then additional GPU types to yep. support AI workloads to bring that back around. Yep, so and am I added, missing anything? Uh, we've added the new L40S GPU, so, so even more intensive uh, processing workloads can be handled. Uh, we've also uh, launched a, a new reference architecture uh, for uh, NVIDIA Riva uh, on top of OpenShift AI running on Apex Cloud Platform for OpenShift. Uh, so the simplicity that the Apex Cloud Platform brings to running OpenShift on bare metal, we now have on top of that OpenShift simplifying AI and uh, the ability to uh, do data pipelines and um, uh, hosting, training models, fine tuning, uh, to be able to manage all aspects of that uh, in, in a much simpler way of doing it. Uh, so we have the, the new NVIDIA Riva uh, design, plus uh, we've done a refresh of the, the white paper that we launched uh, back at KubeCon last year um, for the, the Dell chatbot, which is um, uh, a RAG solution. Uh, so. Yeah, and I, I, I want to, shift back to something you said just a second ago, it caught my attention that I hadn't heard before, so hosting control planes and being able to have almost a multi, I guess you could say multi-client deployment of this, yes. that would seem to bring in a, a different type of buyer, like say an MSP, a CSP, and people, and I, again, with things like OpenShift virtualization and 
some of the other RHEL image stuff that was talked about, that would seem to potentially open up other markets for this as well. It does. Um, yeah, you mentioned multiple, you know, service providers, and that's a, a key use case. Anyone who wants a degree of multi-tenancy that requires you know, separate clusters rather than just separate namespaces on a cluster, um, and then the, the very rapid cluster as a service use cases, which we see a lot of interest in for our customers to rapidly spin them up, spin them down, you know, create a dedicated cluster for a, for a particular test, and then just get rid of it and repurpose the hardware all automatically um, when you're done with it. You see a lot of customers, and the, there's definitely the service provider aspect, but even within enterprise organizations, mm -hmm. they're very rarely just running one cluster, yeah. right? And they're, they're running multiples, and it's not just uh, dev QA and production, right? It's, you've got multiple production clusters, uh, maybe they are doing it for security purposes where they want to isolate applications away from each other, or it could be for licensing purposes where uh, certain applications that they're hosting on that cluster, they, they need to keep um, contained or small, um, or they just want to run smaller clusters, but giving you the ability to do that on um, a more consolidated single um, physical infrastructure. Similar to what a lot of folks do on top of a hypervisor today, but without the need of a third party hypervisor, which adds an additional skill set and adds an additional attack surface, uh, an additional component that needs to be managed, but just doing more OpenShift on top of OpenShift. Yeah, I mean, it, to me it also has an ROI aspect mm -hmm. to it, because I mean, again, I don't have to deploy yet another one to get another cluster. I can go clusters inside clusters. Exactly. Absolutely. Things like that, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Yep. So beyond it being even apexier, um, <laughs> what is the <laughs> positioning in terms of how you're getting the word out to customers that this is something that they, that they could use? So there's a lot of interest in AI today. Um, and a lot of organizations, it's, when you start to look into it, it's very overwhelming initially. Because mm -hmm. where do I start? And there's all, all of these different types of AI and all of these different models and what do I have it do and, and how do I make this work for me? And when you, when you look at building a model and training a model and fine tuning a model, there's a lot of work that goes into that, a lot of really deep technical knowledge that goes into building it properly, the large data sets and the massive amount of compute that it takes to, to train those and the fine tuning work over time. So being able to take off the shelf um, uh, public models or, or, or uh, commercial ones, be able to then add in your own business data without having to go through the process of rebuilding and retraining that model makes AI accessible to a lot more organizations that don't have the resources to go off and build this themselves. Yeah, yeah and you saw that with um, the announcements that were made in the keynotes earlier today, but with the Instruct Lab and RHEL AI, that, you know, that's the left side of the life cycle, if you will. The, the original idea, let's, let's do a simple model, see if we can get something interesting out of this, move to a slightly more powerful platform, start training it with some real data, you know, and then you get into the ML ops portion of that, where I've got to take this, this model that was developed on someone's laptop or maybe an individual server, and now I start talking about you know, training it with a large data set, uh, serving it out across my enterprise, maybe pushing it out to endpoints on in in edge locations, et cetera, and that's where OpenShift AI comes in. You know, OpenShift fundamentally is an app, is a platform for managing workloads. You know, and OpenShift AI brings the AI specific capabilities that we need to it, kind of in the same way that OpenShift virtualization brings the VM specific capabilities that we need to the platform. Yeah, and it would also see, seem that the other announcement, the RHEL AI mm -hmm. announcement that you referenced, would also be a good bridge from going from, hey, I'm on my laptop using Podman mm -hmm. and you know, Instruct Lab and stuff like that, to go to RHEL AI maybe on Dell Apex and in a container, because using the in container image or something right. like that. Something between, a yeah, step between, you know, just a guy on his laptop right. and then OpenShift AI doing a training run 
on a hundred node cluster in Amazon. We, we need something in the middle there. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, I, th I think part of it is when we've been talking about this all day and for <laughs> months now, it's like people want the easy button to AI. Exactly. And, and I think that, again, when this was announced back six months ago, I mean, that was the, the, the light bulb off my head was, I mean, people uh, don't, I don't think, understand how much engineering and joint engineering goes into this. Yes. So there had to be some continued joint engineering and continued improvement because Dell supports this and it, it, it's a joint solution, but there's one, you know, one call, one yep. place to go and things of that nature. And I assume that ex extends over this entire ecosystem. It does. We've, we are very, very deeply integrated between the Dell teams and the Red Hat teams in terms of engineering, testing, uh, support structures that we have for our customers on the back end so that we, you know, yes there are two companies, but from the point of view of the end customer, you know, they're dealing with a single party. Yeah. So, I mean, as we've been all been saying, people want the easy button, but as you had talked about, it is exceedingly difficult to build and train and fine tune a model. It takes so much specialized knowledge and skills. How do customers get their hands on this? And, and are you doing anything here at the Red Hat Summit that, that can help them understand how, how this works and how it could help them? Absolutely. Um, I have a, a session here tomorrow where I'll be talking about the, the two uh, white papers that we've done. Um, the, the one using uh, just a standard uh, LAMA2 uh, model that's freely available, um, and then using retrieval augmented generation uh, to be able to apply your own business knowledge to that within your your, the four walls of your data center so that you can keep control of your data and what the model knows. Um, and then uh, through the N NVIDIA Riva solution, I'll have a demo of that as well. And uh, anybody who's here wants to swing by the Dell booth, we'd be happy to show them. Yeah, I, I think that's the key is understanding that, and we have data from uh, enterprise technology research, ETR, we partner with, that shows that 80% of organizations out of the 1,800 that they pull on a quarterly basis are really just starting to get into, or are evaluating sure. multiple different use cases. And I think we were talking about this, what are the use cases that you're seeing? Because we're, we're seeing that, you know, customer support, code, and content. Those are kind yeah. of the big three that we're seeing. What are you seeing out of this? Uh, so definitely the generative AI is a big one right now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the, the sample that we show is essentially uh, a chat bot that's been trained on all of our technical documentation. So you can ask it a question of how do I do this and it'll actually give you step by step mm -hmm. and then cite the reference to the actual document where you can go pull up the additional details. So those types of things are, are great use cases. But I mean at this point there's so many things that can be done and we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's capable. Um, right now, a lot of organizations are starting to look at this as a differentiator, but very quickly it's going to be uh, the case where organizations are going to have to do something just to keep up. Yeah, I mean, we, all the buzz is around generative AI right now, but you know, as was pointed out earlier today in the, in the keynote from the Boston Children's Hospital, you know, Good old-fashioned, you know, inferencing is still an incredibly important use case for AI. Pattern recognition, image recognition; these are these are big, big use cases. Yep. Uh, we had a, a partnership um, uh, with a customer where they were actually using inferencing to do um, to analyze X-rays mm -hmm. to and generative AI to generate the draft radiology report that would then be reviewed. Um, but allowing um, medical facilities to process this stuff faster uh, and more accurately. So it's, it's pretty amazing the stuff that can be done. So, so given that you guys are on after all of this stuff and it's been six months and all of the, where do you hope to be in the next year? Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Wow. Um, <laughs> this is not a roadmap discussion, it's just, uh, you know, hey, where, where do you see yeah, this test. platform going and being able to support it? Because like you were saying. I think, so, so you mentioned, you know, Michael talked about the level of complexity involved in AI apps, and I think OpenShift right, AI right now is a great set of tools to help manage that complexity. The journey is far from over, though, in terms of making 
these applications um, easier to create, easier to manage. So that's, that's what I think we will continue to see. Um, we'll continue to see the tools mature, we'll continue to see the, the models mature, and things become you know, easier to use, easier to assemble the various models. Yeah, uh, so right now, um, there's still a lot of um, YAML and Jupyter Notebook work involved in all of this. Uh, you can get to a point where you can start to drag and drop components and to start to build these pipelines. Um, as more of that becomes uh, available, either through open source or commercially available, where people can consume that sort of thing and, and put it together the way they need it put together, but without having to write all of that themselves, mm -hmm. I think we're going to continue to see more uh, to help people uh, move faster in that space. Um, we've, uh, one of the things we announced this week was support for object scale, so being able to take in more types of data to, to be able to serve up uh, more of that to host larger models and, and be able to, so it, I think it will continue to just evolve and progress over time mm -hmm. to make it more ubiquitous. Excellent, exciting times. Michael and Ian, thank so. you both so much for coming on theCUBE again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretch. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news.